Um, but you, Ken, were born uh, and raised in Dudley Wood near Cradley Heath. Um, and after gaining your first degree and a PhD in geology in the UK, you moved to Ireland to work with the Geological Survey of Ireland. And then on to the University College Cork, first as a lecturer and then appointed professor of geology. And you're now emeritus professor of geology, having taken early retirement, but you remain an active geologist. Uh, but it, in recent years, and I don't know how long this goes back, perhaps you'll tell us, you've undertaken an extensive study of the geology of the Lignal Peninsula. And that's been published, I think, was it last year or the year before? Yeah, 2018. Uh, 2018. Um, as the geology of the Dingle Peninsula by the Geological Survey of Ireland. And I gather that that publication is still available. Oh, um, yeah. You, yeah, I'll mention that in a few minutes. Okay. Right. And the illustrated talk that you're about to begin will describe the Dingle Peninsula's dramatic 485 million year history. And that's that's quite a quite a time span, isn't yeah. it? Of environmental and climate change. So over to you, Ken. Yeah, I'll try and share the screen now. Okay, so uh, I'm delighted to talk to you this evening to the Society. Uh, I was hoping I could get across in person last spring to uh, give the uh, talk, but unfortunately circumstances changed dramatically and that wasn't possible. Um, so uh, here we are on the virtual Zoom lecture. Um, I hope, I hope you might be taking the liberty of showing uh, the advertisement uh, at the start. I mean, normally it's about halfway through the show that you get the commercial break. But I thought I'd show this slide uh, because everything I'm going to talk about and all the pictures and information are contained in this book. And uh, so, you know, if, if you want more detail, uh, you, you can get this book from the Geological Survey of Ireland online. Um, my title it has been focused down from the original ones, now the Silurian rocks of the Dingle Peninsula, uh, which I thought might be a bit more relevant and, and, and of interest to the society members. Okay, so uh, location, uh, just in case uh, some of your members uh, are not too familiar with uh, the geography and location uh, of the Dingle Peninsula, I thought I'd show this old geology, uh, geology map, which shows there that Dingle Peninsula is situated in Southwest Ireland, where there are four prominent peninsulas. Uh, I'll just get my uh, pointer. Okay, so we have the four main peninsulas in the Southwest of, of Ireland, uh, and Dingle Peninsula is the most northerly. Uh, it's, it has a different type of geology. The, the other peninsulas are mainly in just Devonian and a little bit of Carboniferous, whereas the Dingle Peninsula has a much more varied and diverse geology. Uh, it has Ordovician, uh, Silurian, uh, Devonian, Carboniferous, uh, and so it has got that more variety to it. Now, as you can see, the, uh, the different colors on the map represent obviously the different rock formations. Okay. Well, the Dingle Peninsula is a very long peninsula. Well, it's, it's an elongated peninsula. It's only about 50 kilometers in length, but it's really an area of outstanding natural beauty. The central part of the peninsula is very mountainous with the Slievemish Mountains in the east, uh, a long ridge going out to uh, the Mount Brandon Range in the, in, in the far northwest, uh, reaching heights of over 3,000 feet, 950 meters. Uh, so it's quite dramatic. And then around the fringes of the mountains, we have some wonderful coastal scenery, whether it's beaches and sand spits or just dramatic cliffs falling into the sea very dramatically. Uh, it's also an area of great culture as well. There's, there's great sort of, uh, it's a Celtic area at the far end, which means it's Irish speaking communities, but there's also a great culture in archeology span and, uh, and music and poetry. So it's, it's got a lot going for it. Now, this is a more simplified map of the peninsula. The yellows and the browns represent, and the reds represent the Devonian rocks, which form the bulk of the geology. But you will notice there are two areas in green. Uh, we have the, uh, at the far end here, we have the lighter green, which is the Silurian in Lyra at Dunquin. And then there's a narrow strip in the Eastern part of the peninsula, 
which is Ordovician and Silurian, and what's called the Anascore Derry Moor Glen inlayer. And these two inlayers of lower Paleozoic rocks are the focus of tonight's lecture. You'll also see on this map the main structural components of the, of the geology, and they are essentially north, east, southwest trending uh, folds and uh, major faults which have the Caledonian northeast southwest grain. And these faults are very, have been very influ influential throughout both Silurian and Devonian geology in controlling and having a, a major bearing on the depositional basins. Now then, uh, just a reminder uh, of the Silurian stratigraphy. Uh, some of the, I'll be mentioning some of these names. Um, you can see there are four series, the Clandovery, the Wenlock and the Ludlow, named from Wales and the Welsh borderlands. And then at the very top, you have the Pridley, named from the Czech Republic. And in the present tour, and by the way, these are the absolute uh, isotopic ages, which calibrate the stratigraphy, uh, ranging from 443 roughly at the base, 419 at the top. And the Dingle Silurian uh, is in this, comprises this interval just, represented in this interval just here between the Clandovery Wenlock up, uh, boundary possibly up to the mid Ludlow. So that's just sort of giving you the, the, the context of where we are in the Silurian. Now, another context I want to talk about very briefly is the, the, the bigger picture, the plate tectonic setting of the Silurian. And this uh, global map shows the, uh, the world in Silurian times uh, Ordovician Silurian times with a big uh, continent around the South Pole of Gondwana. And then in the north, further north, we have the continent here of Laurentia to the northwest. Uh, and in the center here, we have the uh, microcontinent of Eastern Abalonia and with an ocean in between called the Iapetus Ocean. And that's enlarged on that little section there, that little interval there is enlarged here. So you can see Eastern Abalonia. You can see Laurentia to the northwest, and there's the ocean, the Iapetus Ocean. And Southern Ireland, and indeed Southern uh, Britain and Northern Britain, was located on the margins of this Eastern Babylonian continent, whereas Scotland and Northern part of Ireland was located uh, on the margins of the Laurentia continent. But of course, this ocean closed during the Silurian uh, due to a plate tectonic movements, and at the southern part of this uh, ocean, near the eastern Avalonian um, margin, we have a destructive plate boundary where the lithosphere has been subducted down. And as it subducts down, it brings the two continents closer together and closes the ocean. And as subduction takes place, we get melting and we get the eruption of volcanic material, volcanoes and the volcanic uh, magmas and uh, pyroclastic deposits in a series of volcanic islands, a volcanic arc. And, and that's, the, that's the environment that we'll be talking about this evening for a short while. If we look at the paleogeography of that in a little bit more detail, this is taken from uh, Charles Holland's book, uh, Geology of Ireland from 2009. It has a picture of the Wenlock mid Silurian paleogeography showing the position of Dingle and the position of Dudley. So you can see Dudley here out in the east and further to the east is on the shallow uh, carbonate shelf, uh, much more shallow water, quieter deposition. Whereas as we go further east, we go into a deeper water fasces of, uh, of uh, West Wales and then out into Central Ireland in gratolytic mudstones. And then in mudstone, and then when we get to Dingle, we're in this or appears to be a slightly more shallower area with volcanoes. And this is an inter-arc basin behind those volcanic islands I was talking about. And the deposition was around the fringes of these volcanic islands. And so we had slightly more shallower environments around the margins of the, uh, of the uh, volcanic islands. So, this is the kind of environment that the Dingle Silurian was deposited in. We have volcanic islands with, with very um, explosive eruptions. 
We have stormy seas due to uh, tidal waves and tsunamis from the earthquakes. And so this is a kind of a depositional setting which sums up much of the sedimentary environments. We have shallow shelf uh, uh, environments, we have, we have back barriers, we have shore face deposits, we have lagoons, we have floodplains and coastal plains around the volcanic islands. So this is the setting then for the stratigraphy and the rocks I'm going to talk about. Right, so let's talk about the Silurian rocks in Dingle. Well, the first record of Silurian rocks in Dingle was in 1830 uh, in an article by Thomas Weaver, who reported fossils from the ferritous cove beds at the western end of the Dingle Peninsula. And he said that they had a strong resemblance with similar fossil casts occurring at Tortworth in Gloucestershire, which I've just noticed I've misspelled. Anyway, uh, so fossils, he thought these were uh, fossils were very similar to Silurian fossils from Tortworth. At this time, the first geological map of Ireland was being made by Sir Richard Griffith, and that was published in 1839. But before he published it, he sent some of these fossils to London to be identified by uh, Sir Roderick Urgenson, the well-known king of Siluria, which I believe there's a Dudley connection because of Murchison's famous visit to Dudley in 1849. Anyway, Murchison identified these fossils as Silurian. He confirmed the Silurian age. In 1855, Murchison became the director of the British Geological Survey. And of course, Ireland was part of the, uh, of the empire, part of the union then. And he, one of his local offices was the Geological Survey uh, of Ireland office. And he visited Ireland on a three week tour in 1856 to visit the Dingle Peninsula and one of animal areas as well. He had three weeks and he noted at the end of his trip that the geology of Ireland was the dullest in Europe and the weather was absolutely wretched. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping tonight I might show you that that's not quite the case. Okay, so our first port of call will be the Dunquin Inlier at the far western end of the Dingle Peninsula. Here's a simplified map of that western end of the peninsula, shown in blue are the Silurian rocks. And they're surrounded in, in, by these brown shaded, orange shaded rocks. They're the Devonian. So you can see it truly as an inlier. But it's fault bounded both to the, to the south and to the north. <clears throat> I'm now going to show you uh, a, a, a photograph of the coastline from Clarehead looking northwards to this orange shaded area here, which is Sybil Head and the Three Sisters. So we're looking northwards now from Clarehead to the Three Sisters and, and Sybil Head. And this part of the section in the Silurian is the most accessible part uh, and it's really well exposed. So this is the panorama looking from Clarehead northwards to Sybil Head and here are the three sisters and in the foreground you'll see where the beach is and further in the cove over there the rocks are brownie colored yellow colored these are the Silurian rocks all the way out here to the point and then the rocks forming the headland are, are colored red, they're, they're, that's the, the lower old red sandstone in the foreground here. And then on the tip, we have, we have a major unconformity and these are the middle Devonian. And these are middle Devonian out here. So all the red rocks you can see in the distance are Devonian and all the rocks in the central part of the area are Silurian. And I'll be taking you through this succession uh, to have a look at the characteristics of the Silurian formations. But first of all, I should mention the structure. So a minute ago, we, I was showing you a section from Clarehead. Uh, that was the section I was showing you, looking from, from Clarehead northwards to Sybil Point or Sybil Head here. The, these in green here are the Devonian, but in, all these rocks here are Silurian and they are fault bounded to the south and fault bounded to the north. 
So this is the inlier of the Silurian. And as you can see, it is folded into a series of what we call recumbent folds, where the, on the anticlines, the northern limb is overturned, it's inverted. So you can see that's the right way up and then that's overturned. And then this is the right way up. And then it would have been overturned here as well, except a large fault has cut through the core of the anticline. Uh, but one formation is, is inverted. So that's the one that's coming back the other way. So it, it's quite complex uh, uh, in some respects. The other structural feature I should mention is that there is a strong tectonic cleavage fabric in the rocks. Uh, so you always have to be aware of that, uh, particularly if you're mapping. So here we have the bedding uh, dipping to the right as you look at it. This, 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 this is thick beds uh, dipping to the, to the right. And then there is a much steeper fabric, which is about uh, maybe 75, 80 degrees, also dipping in the same direction to the southeast, but much steeper and, and very closely spaced. And that's the tectonic cleavage. And that has some implications later on when I show you a few fossils. Okay, so now the succession. Now the succession in the Dominion Inlier is about 1,500 meters in thickness. And it's, uh, it's been divided into seven formations, which are shown here. And, not, and it's a mixed succession, a succession of marine siliciclastics. Sil 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 so there's no carbonates or very, few, very little carbonate, no limestones, sandstones, siltstones, mudstones, representing a range of different environments. Then we have some red beds, continental red, red beds, which are mainly fluvial and a few coastal plain and a few lacustrine lake deposits. And then we have a, a really important uh, sequence of rocks in here, which are volcanic rocks, pyroclastic uh, deposits, tuffs, ashes, and ignimbrites, and also extrusive lavas. And what I'm proposing to do is just briefly go through the some of the key points of this succession, showing you some of the, uh, some of the sedimentary structures, some of the uh, fossils, and some of the volcanics. So we'll start then at the, at the, as we always do in geology, we start at the base in the Coos Glass Formation, uh, the oldest formation in the sequence. So we're now at the very northern end of the inlier. This is the Devonian with the Sybil head and the three sisters. And we have these two faults here, uh, which bracket, envelope, a, a uh, formation which we call the Coos Glass Slate Formation. And that's at the base of the, of the Silurian succession. But I should say that for many years, it, was, it wasn't called that. It was thought to be the Drum Point Formation, which is much higher up the succession. And I'll, I'll show you the evidence why why we changed uh, uh, the opinion on the stratigraphic position of that. Okay, this is the Coos Glass Slate Formation. This is Coos Glass, the inlet, and there's the bounding fault which separates the Devonian from the Silurian. And you can see here it's very thinly bedded slaty rocks. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, in these rocks, there are no shelly faunas. There's no benthic faunas, no brachiopods or trilobites or crinoids. But there are some uh, casts, or that should have been molds. There are some molds of um, cavities where orthoconic nautiloid shells uh, were once preserved. You can see some of the ribbing still there. Nautiloid, nautiloids are free swimming cephalopods. So these were animals which were swimming around in the water, and then when they died, they sank down. So even if the bottom conditions weren't very Con conducive for uh, habitation for bottom dwelling benthos, uh, it was no problem uh, for preserving free swimming uh, animals that were living in the water column. There are a few simple uh, burrows in there as well, which means that uh, the little creatures that made those burrows must have been respiring. So the bottom conditions weren't anaerobic, they weren't anoxic, but we, we do believe that these sediments were fairly deep water. Now I said that these sediments were once thought to be much younger, 
But we now know that they are actually uh, uh, much older than previously thought because I've obtained microfossils from those slates. And, and these are acrotarchs, which are the cysts of marine phytoplankton. These were the, these were the, uh, the plankton that was floating around in the water. And then when in their life cycle, they insist during the productive stage and then they, they, they break open and the, free, the, 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 the planktonic forms come out, but they leave behind their cysts. And these are preserved in the rock. These are only about 20 to 40 microns in size. But the different types here are typical of the late Clandovery to early Wenlock. So that is older than the subsequent uh, formations in the Silurian. So we now know this is a, the, the oldest formation in the succession. Now, I'm now going to move up above the Coos glass plate into what's called the Fulgner Formation. And here and now, here is a big fault, Juno fault. And here are the Coos glass slates, and this is the base of the Fallen Manor formation. And it's a large, thick lava flow. Uh, it's very faulted, as you can see, lots of quartz veining along the fault plane. And when you examine the actual lava, you'll see there's lots of lath shaped crystals of plagioclase feldspar, which have a slight crude alignment. That's the biro, uh, showing that the flow structure. Uh, in the lava flow. This is the top of that lava in this bottom diagram to the right. And overlying that, we have red beds, sandstones mainly. And this is, these are the red sandstones of the Fallen Manor Formation. It's very difficult to get down into that cove. Uh, so I, I really haven't got very much to show you there. It just re represents uh, fluvial deposits and mainly sheet, sheet flood deposits around the edge of the, uh, of the coastal plain uh, flanking the volcano. Now I'm moving above the Fallen Manor into one of the most interesting formations in the succession. This is the Ferritus Cove Formation. You recall, this is where the fossils were first found in 1830. And it's a beautiful location, uh, a sheltered bay with a beautiful little beach. And in this, <coughs> pardon me, in this uh, uh, Ferritus Cove formation, we have five uh, cycles of sedimentation. They're called parasequences. Uh, five stacked, that means one on top of the other, five stacked coursing up sequences, which have been interpreted as shallowing up regressive cycles. So it means it starts with a transgression and then it gets more and more shallower. And then you get a, a, a an eruption, and then shortly after that, it's you'll see it then start another cycle starts again. So we've got these five cycles. Now here is a, an enlargement of one of those cycles. Uh, so at the bottom we have the offshore shelf, the the, the 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 open marine conditions. Then we have the what's called the near shore barrier and shore face. These are the turbulent uh, areas where the waves are breaking. And then there's usually an eruptive event followed by tidal flats and lagoons. So you can see it's basically uh, regressing, getting shallower as you move up through each cycle. And the, so each cycle is around about 50, uh, 50 meters thick. So just to put that into a, a depositional context, this is the offshore uh, transgressive part. Then we have the barriers, the shore face. Then we have the, uh, the tidal flats and the lagoons. I haven't got the volcanic uh, event in there, but you can imagine that will be the ash which falls down uh, onto, the, um, onto the particular uh, fascies that it's uh, landing on. Okay, I just want to show you, first of all, the offshore shelf, the open marine uh, fascies. Um, the rock, they are calcareous siltstones and uh, non calcareous siltstones. And this is the kind of uh, uh, exposure, the kind of outcrop, very accessible. The, the road is just across the, uh, just across the other side of the beach. And these, these rocks here, which are sticking up, poking up, they're the calcareous siltstones, whereas the, 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 the lower, more subdued outcrop 
are the non-calcareous uh, siltstones, but they are both contain plenty of fossils, but of slightly different types. So in the in the um, in the shelly, in, in the uh, non-calcareous siltstones, we have a diverse uh, invertebrate, marine invertebrate fauna, which is dominated by brachiopods. And you may recognize some of these. There's a lot more. I'm just showing three particular common types, rhynchonellids, atropids, and leptinids. And you, you, you may know some of, you recognize some of these from the Dudley fossils. There are also some very large bivalves, uh, teratonella, and some very nice gastropods as well uh, in, 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 the, in the assemblages. The brachiopods are the most common uh, uh, invertebrate uh, shell. Uh, and there's one particular species which is particularly abundant. And this is a spirifer with a very deep sulcus uh, 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 on, the, uh, on the pedicle valve. Uh, you see here, uh, it's very, it's very uh, emphasized there. And this was identified by Mike Bassett from the, uh, I think he was with, he used to be with the Welsh Natural History Museum. I don't know if it's still there or the museum, I'm sure. But anyway, it's called Holcomb's Spirifer by Gugosis. And Mike Bassett said, and he's got great experience of brachiopods, salivary brachiopods, he had never seen this species anywhere else in the world, in the salurian. And he, and, he, and he described it as, a, as an endemic species. And there was another uh, brachiopod higher up the succession, which was also in the same category, an endem endemic species. So it may have been that around these, around, in the sea, just around these volcanic islands, uh, there was a, a very localized uh, specific fauna, uh, which didn't migrate to other areas and was just then, uh, particular to the, to the deep here in some of the beds, particularly the beds that are more fine grained, which take a cleavage, which takes the tectonic fabric more easily. Uh, you see that some of the shells are distorted, and this is due to the structural deformation to the shearing. Uh, so you may see it in, in a moment on some of the trilobites. Now, the trilobites. Uh, are mainly disarticulated. And so you, you do tend to find uh, pygidia in particular uh, and fragments uh, of Kefalon. Uh, and very rarely do you find complete specimens like these two. Uh, this one here was found by an undergraduate student um, uh, many years ago. Uh, and he very kindly donated it to, to me and, the, and, and to the department. And you'll be, you won't be surprised to know that he got a first class honors degree. Uh, now, the, the other very nice find here was, was a compound eye. And as you know, trilobites have remarkable vision. And they have these uh, multi, you know, hundreds of lenses in the eye. Uh, and this particular one uh, is called the holocrowal eye, which is the most common one, where all the lenses are tightly packed together, uh, giving excellent uh, all around vision. And again, you may notice some of the structural deformation, some of the shearing, uh, not particularly in that one, but certainly in this one and, and, and these pygidia, where it all seems a bit lopsided. The structural geologists like this kind of thing for measuring the amount of, de uh, amount of shear. Uh, uh, but I think it's a shame for these poor trilobites to be sheared up anyway. Now, in the calcareous siltstones, which were the, which were the beds which were standing proud, which are, it has an almost a monospecific form, not quite, but the main fossil in these calcareous siltstones are these subcircular shaped colonies uh, of the coral, uh, the tabulated coral phagocytes. And very often, uh, almost, you know, 95% of the time, the corals are weathered out they decalcified. And so all you get is these sort of holes where the coralites were once residing. And they, they've, been, they've been dissolved out. Uh, so it, 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 most of these then show a very kind of pockmarked weathering characteristic. But occasionally you do get 
uh, some fresh specimens where there hasn't been this, with this dissolving out of the carbonate. And you can see uh, in this case, you can see the white calcite. And in this one, you can see the nice polygonal shaped uh, pattern of the back-to-back -back coralites. And remember, the tabulate corals don't have any radial scepter, so they're, they're, they're quite simple in construction. There have been a few discoveries of graptolites in the Ferritus Cove formation, uh, and, uh, rare specimens of the Monograptus uh, flemingi, uh, which were found by a very famous paleontologist and, and one of his students, and if anyone knows Mike Benton from Bristol, Bristol have a very strong connection with the Dingle Peninsula. They bring many field trips over uh, at undergraduate level uh, and they've done a lot of research as well, uh, particularly in sedimentology. And on one of their trips, they found some graptolites, Monograptus uh, flemingi, which apparently is a characteristic species of the Lundgreni graptolite zone, which is Homerian in age from the upper part the upper part of the Wenlock series. So that gives a good age for the Ferritus Cove formation. Again, we, we found a lot, I always like to bring the, some, some microfossils because uh, these are, this, this was the, you know, the base of the food chain. This is what all the, this is what all the invertebrates were munching on. Uh, so it was a very diverse uh, assemblage of Wenlock acritox. And uh, I think probably many of these have been found in the, in, in the limestone uh, of, of, the, of the Dudley area. I, I know a, 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 an old friend of mine, Ken Dorning, did a lot of work on the palynology of the, of, of the Wenlock limestone in Dudley. And I'm sure he's recorded most of these forms. But, the, you know, despite, the, despite the, the, the structural tectonic deformation, you can still see there's a very, very nice, uh, delicate preservation uh, of the processes uh, in these uh, in, in these aquatoxists. So I was I've just been showing you the the very fossiliferous offshore open shelf um, plastic fasces of the of, of the um, of, of the sedimentary regressive cycle. But as things get shallower, fossils and life becomes less common because of the turbulent nature of the high energy uh, conditions around the shore face. So instead you see cross stratified sandstones like this here, uh, forming uh, beautiful um, homicky cross stratification. And then above these sandstones, you get a volcanic uh, bed up to about 10 meters thick, which, it, which again, it weathers uh, as very jaggedy, uh, upstanding uh, beds uh, and rock in, in, in the beach uh, section. And when you look closely, you can see all the different uh, components of the ash, quite angular fragments. So this is probably uh, an airfall ash rather than being uh, reworked. It's, it's just falling straight on, onto the barrier sands. And then above that, we have a totally different type of, uh, of, of, uh, of sedimentary environment. Uh, and lithology, we have these laminated beds at millimeter scale, thin sands and muds, repetitiously uh, uh, repeated, uh, what have been called pinstripe laminations. And these have been interpreted, interpreted by the sedimentologists as tidal lights, tidal flat rhythmites, where the tide was coming in and out every day, depositing sand, uh, as, it, as it flowed in, and as it flowed out in the slack water before the next uh, tide, you get the fine settling out. So you get these repetitious pinstripe laminated. And every now and again, you, the coast, the tidal flats dry out. And so you get desiccation, you get subaerial conditions, and they crack in the sun, in the, in the heat of the sun, and you get these desiccation cracks uh, on the bedding plane. And then you get associated with the tidal flats, you get what are called co lagoonal coral beds. And these are small patch reefs uh, in, the, in the, uh, the back barrier 
in the subtidal sub areas where you get little uh, patches of these monospecific uh, coral faunas forming the, the little patch reefs. And again, most of the time, these are dissolved out, they're decalcified. So you get small holes in the rock, like down here by the hammer. But occasionally, and very occasionally, they haven't been dissolved out, and you can actually see the, the calcified skeleton of the Parastriatopora colony. And, and this is what is beautifully preserved. And that's about 10 centimeters. And it's in growth position. It's actually fanning, branching upwards towards the light. Now, uh, what is the interest here is how did these cycles, these regressive cycles, repeat the five stack sequences? And how, so how did they form and how did, how did they repeat? And Rod Sloan, who did his PhD, a, a Bristol student who did his PhD on the, uh, on the section, and Brian Williams, uh, his supervisor, uh, famous uh, cinematologist, and the, and the put forward this hypothesis of what they call the volcano tectonic control of local sea level, produced by magma chamber bulge, eruption, and magma chamber collapse. So here we have the, the magma chamber of the, volcanic, of the volcano swelling up, filling up, and as it does, it, the land rises, and so the, the, the sea level starts to drop as the land rises. So we get regression and we get the back barrier and, and the tidal flats forming. Then there's the eruption. So we, and then after the eruption, the magma chamber collapses, it sinks. And so the land drops and the sea comes in and brings in the marine, uh, uh, Fasces, the siltstones, the silt, and the uh, shelly faunas. And then it repeats itself. So it's only local. They're not eustatic. They don't occur everywhere over the world, but they, 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 they affected the areas in the vicinity, in the environs around the volcanoes. Okay, so that's the photoscope formation. And that's succeeded by the Clarehead formation and this forms very prominent headlands along the coast. I should say by the way that this coastal section there's a, there's, there's a beautiful uh, path, coastal path uh, all the way around so it's very very accessible and you can dive into, not literally dive in, but you can go into small coves along the way. Now the Clarehead, Clarehead formation is the main volcanic formation. Now this shows a picture looking at one of those headlands and there's, 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 there's students in here for scale. And it's very safe on the top, although it looks very precipitous. You, we don't go down there, we just look at the rocks on the top. And you can see these large, these large uh, units of volcanic rock, which are layered, they're, in, they're bedded. And because they are air for in this particular part, they, the, the volcano has blown out ash it's then gone into the air and then it's fallen down and got deposited in the sea to form this layer, very thick layer of lithic uh, tuff, volcanic ash, and that's much finer volcanic ash. And then this blocky unit on to the right, the different types of volcanic rock. This is a welded tuff, which forms an ignimbrite, which was formed by an ignimbrite flow hot gaseous flow. So I'll just show you some textures. So this is the lithic tuff. You can see all the fragments uh, inside the tuff. Very co uh, coarse and very poorly sorted. Whereas the welded tuff has a much more ordered structure. It's got flow alignment. It's got these flattened uh, structures here, which are called fiame. This is where they've been the, the, the pumice has been flattened and gone glassy by the heat inside of these flows was very, very hot. So we got these fiamme structures you can see them here. So these, and this one is a nodular tuff or a stereolytic tuff, 
where the uh, where the ash has been hang on my internet oh, sorry, where the, uh, the the pumice has been has been devitrified and, and and forms these these nodules so when we look at a section we can see here where i just showed that that cliff i showed you earlier shows the shows the ashes the lithic ashes at the bottom and then two sections of welded tuff uh, maybe about 10 meters 15 20 meters thick then there's another ash and then more um, welded tuff so these the, these sections this one of welded tuff and this one separated by ash these represent pyroclastic flows what we call ignimbrites and this is just the lower portion and there are several of these major uh, flows uh, in the Clarehead volcanic formation, a thick formation. This Ms. Paul shows you how the volcano produced this uh, pyroclastic material. It's erupted, you get the volcanic gas umbrella cloud that then gets dispersed by the wind and it falls into the sea or the coastal plain as an ashfall deposit, a lithic tuff. Whereas the other flow is where the molten material flows at very, very fast and hot um, material flows down the side of the volcano and uh, at great speed and then flows into the sea where it can then cause a laha, a, a huge mud flow uh, deposit. It, uh, and we find these in, in certain places uh, uh, further along the coast. And then you, you may also get more viscous material coming out as a extrusive lava flow. So all the volcanic rocks you see in the Clyde volcano uh, formation <coughs> can be related to the products of these, what are called explosive Plinian eruptions from these volcanic uh, volca uh, island volcanoes. So where were the volcanoes? Well, I've just been showing you sections round here, Ferritus Cove and Clare Head. But if you go further south in the Inlier, down to the southern part of the Inlier, the, the volcanic material formation is much thicker. And so the volcanic deposits thicken dramatically to the south. And in the southern Blasket Island of Inishbikalorn, there are 900 meters of andesitic basaltic lava. So we're getting much closer to the volcanic vent. This is the ash and the, and the pyroclastic flow which came down from the volcanoes. And this is the more viscous uh, extrusive lava which, was coming, which came out from the vents uh, proximal. Geophysical investigations, particularly the aeromagnetic survey, which was flown over Ireland, showed a major anomaly about 10 kilometers to the west and southwest of Inishvikalon, suggesting to the geophysicists that this was where the main volcanic, volcanic vents were located. So what, is, what, are, what are the implications of volcanoes and volcanics deposits in the Dingle Silurian? The dingle, the dingle volcanics are very thick. And they're not just a few beds, they're hundreds and hundreds of meters thick. Pyroclastics, lavas. And they are a rare example of Silurian volcanism south of the Iapetus suture. That means on the southern side of the Iapetus ocean. There are some records of Silurian volca volcanics at Skoma off the Pembrokeshire coast in Tortworth, in Gloucestershire, and also in the Eastern Mendips, but nothing of the scale of the Dingle volcanics. The, ge the geochemistry that was done by Rod Sloan, the trace element geochemistry, said there were sub alkaline volcanic rocks, and they were typical of the volcanic rocks which form at a destructive 
continental plate margin. Now, this is quite interesting because to get that, you have to have subduction. You have to have melting to bring the volcanic material to the surface. And so to it, but the subduction that normally occurred at the southern side of the Aptus Suture was in the Ordovician, the mid to upper Ordovician. Uh, think about the, think about the, the Snowden volcanics in the Ordovician or the, the lake, the Borodell volcanics in the Lake District or the Waterford volcanics in, 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 in Southeast Ireland. So this is a very unusual occurrence of volcanic rocks, uh, a very young occurrence. So to explain this, uh, Sloan and Bennett uh, said that the volcanism may represent a localized subduction of the final portion of the Iapetus oceanic crust beneath Eastern Avalonia. And it may have been related to the, to the obliquely orientated closure, the scissor-like closure, didn't just close tangentially, but it closed like a scissors. And later in the south, um, the southwest, where Dingle was. Now, there have been some suggestions that the, it is not a volcanics as a continent, destructive continental plate ma margin. It may have been within plate, it might have been extension within the plate, but the geochemistry is quite strong in suggesting it is at a destructive plate boundary. So that is an unusual, an unusual uh, occurrence, but it, it gives a, a unique uh, signature to the Dingle Peninsula. Now above the volcanics, we have a red bed succession. Now I'll briefly mention this red bed succession called the Mill Cove as a very unusual lithology, which you may not have seen before. Uh, there are sandstones, there are some, uh, <clears throat> there are some calcretized siltstones, which represent ancient fossil soils. There's also these mottle beds. We get this intricate mottling of red and gray green layers, which are slightly broken up. And these have been interpreted by, <clears throat> as being formed by uh, fluctuating oxygen conditions in, ground, in the groundwater that was surrounding uh, small ponds and lakes uh, on the coastal plain around the fringes of the volcano. So when the, when the water was more oxic, maybe due to more rainfall or to, to, to flooding, uh, the, the, the sediment <coughs> was reddened and then when it, 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 there was less oxygen, maybe there was reducing conditions, more stagnation in the water, uh, more anoxic conditions, it became greeny gray. So these have been described as ferry creeks, uh, which formed in, uh, in and around temporary lakes, uh, uh, which add fluctuating um, oxygen uh, conditions in, in, in the sediment. The other interesting thing in the, that, that particular layer there is a volcanic uh, pyroclastic layer, and there's another one here, but this one has some very large structures, which have been, and that one's nearly, nearly a meter, that's my, that's my rucksack, which is about 40 centimeters, but that's a, interpreted as a volcanic bomb. This was a ballistic lump of lava, which was explosively blown out of the volcano, could have traveled maybe 10 kilometers to land on the coastal plain uh, in, the, uh, in, in the Mill Cove uh, area. So that just shows then the volcanoes. These are, this is the coastal plain, the fluvial plain around the volcanoes, fringing them, and with temporary lakes where the ferrocretes would have formed, maybe sheet flood sands here, and then occasionally volcanic ash and bombs landing on, on this mudflat. Now, uh, the drum point formation, a very interesting formation. This is where the sea comes back in and we get marine conditions again. The drum point formation, shallow marine sandstones and siltstones deposited under 
storm influence conditions. And that's the reason they say storm influence, because when you look at the layering in the sandstones, they're not nice, even layers. They are undulating. You can see the beds here, they, they, they undulate. And that's due, and also there, there's many surfaces with wave ripples. And the undulations are due to what's called hummocky and swaley cross bedding or cross stratification. So when you look at a section through the layers, you can see here the, the, these concave structures, which are the swales, and then you get convex structures, which are the hummocks. And there's a little di diagram here showing that. And this is, this is due to the storms. So these occurred, this sedimentary structure occurred above storm wave, bend, uh, wave base, but below the fair weather wave base in this area here, where the storms would scoop out sediment and then redeposit it uh, later on as the storm abated. So you get this cross bedding where the sediment is being redeposited in, the, in these depressions. So this is hummocky and swaley cross stratification. You also get, as the storm abates, animals that were living on the seabed, shelly animals, would get swept up and their shells would be scattered and transported. And then the, 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 the wave action would aggregate, would accumulate them in the depressions in little hollows, all broken up accumulations of shells in these little pods, which you can see here. They're like lenticular pods and there. And they very often get weathered and dissolved out, decalcified. And you can see here examples of the material, the shell material inside of these pods, inside of these uh, lenticles. Uh, they're about they can be up to about 75, 80 meters in length. And lots of crinoid debris, uh, a few brachiopods, some trilobite pygidia, lots of crinoids here. And they have this rusty, rotten stone uh, appearance. The other thing which is very, very characteristic of this formation is a very distinctive fossil. It's a trace fossil, which is absolutely profuse. It's everywhere. And this is called chondrites. Now, chondrites, when you first see it, you, you, you think it's a plant, a branching plant with all its uh, stems. But in fact, it's not. It's a sub-horizontal, so it's just on the surface or just under the surface, sub-horizontally branching. And it represents a feeding burrow system where it was exploiting the nutrients at a particular level. So these are found in the fines, in the silts, which settled out slowly after the storms. And, uh, and then these little animals, wherever they were, we haven't found them, would slowly mine the surface to, to eat all the goodies uh, in, the, in, in, in the subsurface, just below the surface or at the surface. So these are called chondrites. Uh, a feeding burrow system, which is everywhere. It's the most characteristic fossil and is distinctive of the drum point formation. The burrows themselves are now infilled with sand, they've been casted, but they stand proud, so they're beautifully, pre beautifully preserved. Now, this is the cross section I showed you earlier. We've gone through the succession, and right uh, in the center here, we have the top of the drum point formation. This is the drum point formation. And you can see here on the, on the south, sorry, the north side of Claw Head, there's a little patch of shaded here. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of a, a purple color. And that's the old red sandstone, the Devonian old red sandstone. So at this particular point, and it's the only point that I've come across, we can see a very clear contact between the Silurian and the overlying Devonian. And you can see that the layers are fairly, they're dipping the same way. It looks continuous, but there's a very distinctive erosional surface here. 
cuts down into the, and gets even more uh, cutting down uh, around the corner. So this is an erosional unconformity. This is Wenlock, so the mid, mid, mid uh, Silurian, mid upper Silurian. And this is Lower Devonian. Uh, this, is, this has been dated not here, but at, at another location. So this is, so there's quite a big time gap here where there was uplift and erosion. In other places, it's the faulty, the contact between the Silurian and the Devonian is nearly always faulted. But here we have a, an erosional contact. Finally, in the, in the uh, succession, we have what's called the Cro-Marin formation. This is the youngest formation of the Silurian in the Dunquin layer. And it's only exposed in land. We don't see it on the coast. It's not present. And we don't see a contact with it with the underlying drum point. So it's, it's, it's like an isolated uh, occurrence. Uh, but it's well exposed in small outcrops and stream sections around Crowbar and Mountain. I, the outcrops are fairly scrappy, and, and this is just a drainage channel uh, on the hillside, and you have to scrap around in these exposures. But you do find some nice fossils. These are some nice tabulate corals of Heliolites. At the top of this track, there used to be a small quarry, a uh, very small quarry. Uh, the local farmer was taking out slate, and in those slates, there were some graptolites, which Doug Palmer uh, identified when he was in Trinity in Dublin as uh, graptolites of the Lentwardinensis graptolite zone, which is uh, sort of lower to mid uh, Ludfordian. Uh, that's in the uh, upper part of the Ludlow. Um, now, so I've spent a lot of time talking about this particular inlayer because it's very accessible. There's a very interesting succession and it has this very unique uh, uh, sequence of volcanic rocks. <clears throat> the other place I want to talk very briefly now, I've more or less done most of the talk now, is, the, is this inlier in the eastern part of the uh, peninsula, which, which again is fault bounded, and I'll show you some of the faults in a moment. And I want to talk about two areas. This area here, which is called the Bull's Head Cousatoric, which is on the coast. And then to finish, I want to go into the mountains to show you the Silurian in Derrymore Glen. Uh, access to these locations is much more difficult and much more challenging. The sea cliffs are very steep. The mountain localities are very remote. So this was the easy part. This is the more difficult part. Now, let's go back a second. So we're going now to look at the Bull's Head Cousatoric area. The Bull's Head Cousatoric area is one of the most famous geological localities in Ireland. It's a classic locality because here we have one of the earliest records of someone describing the angular unconformity with the very steeply dipping lower Devonian overlain by the gently dipping upper Devonian. It's a classic angular unconformity, which was described by Dukes and Dunoyer uh, in 1850, sorry, in 1863 in the memoir. And this is a field sketch done, which was uh, completed by Dunoyer. Dunoyer was a, one of those geological survey geologists, an excellent geologist, but, but also a very fine artist. I, know, I now want to show you the cliff on the other side of this headland. So this is Bull's Head. Now the, the next cliff face is on the other side of this steep headland here. And this is Cousatoric. So this is, this is Bull's Head out here. And this is the eastern side of Bull's Head in the cove, which is Cousatoric. Again, very difficult to get down into this cove. I was down there once with a geologist called Simon Todd, a very, very good, very excellent geologist. And we had to put down uh, ropes, not to abseil, but just as a hand rail, a safety guide, because the track down is very, very unstable. And it's one, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a section which uh, 
condenses, distills much of the geology of Dingle because it, it has so much history here. At the bottom, we have the Ordovician. Then there's an unconformity and we have the Silurian. Then there's another unconformity and then we have the Lower Devonian. And then there's another unconformity and then we have the Upper Devonian. So in 60 meters of cliff face, we, we, have, we have, not completely, but we have a pretty good story of the history of Dingle geology. But I want to focus on what's at the bottom of the cliff down here at the base where we have the Silurian rocks. And <clears throat> right at the very base, we have a, a, this unconformity. The, red, red, the reddish rocks are called the Anascore formation. The creamy rocks is the Silurian Balinan formation. And this uneven line here, which is in yellow, is the unconformity between them. And some years ago, uh, I won't mention any names, but before 1996, all of this, the Anna School and the Balinam, was considered to be all Silurian. Certainly the Balinam is Silurian. It's got, it's got limestones with uh, Silurian corals in there. But the Anna School has no fossils in. It's tectonically much more complex. Metamorphically, it is more complex, and there is this unconformity. Now, <clears throat> we had some students mapping down here for their undergraduate projects, and I, not at this locality, but at another locality, which I'll show you now, this locality here in Menard Bay, not only about five, three or four kilometers away, the Anna School rocks, as you can see, are very, very tightly folded, there's, a very, there's two very prominent cleavages. There are these major slump deposits. And they look much more deformed and older than the, than the Silurian limestones of the Ballyman Formation. Within these rocks, there are some dark gray mudstones. And when we processed these in the Micropelia lab, they had acrotox. And the acrotox turned out to be early Ordovician and not Silurian. And this is a nice plate showing the acrotox, which are very different than the acrotox that we found in the Silurian rocks in the Don Queen inline. And so this, this, this uh, <clears throat> was conclusive evidence uh, that these were early Ordovician from the, from the uh, Tremodocian, or what used to be called the Arenic, it's now called the Flonian. I'm now going into the mountains for the last stage of this talk to the Sleeve Mish Mountains in the eastern part, at the northeastern part of the peninsula, to Cal Connery. This is about 2,740 feet in height, or 835 meters. This is, this is Cal, Cal Connery Mountain with a ridge running down. The first locality is called the Commons locality uh, on the high up on the slopes of, 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 uh, of Cal Connery. It's about a, it's nearly a two hour walk, hour and a half walk into this locality over bog. And there it is on the side of the hillside. You can see the streams coming down. This particular stream here by the star, there's an enlargement of, this, of, of that particular stream. And then about halfway up, you see a junction between the school of Odivisia, and above that we have the Balinan Silurian, Balinan formation. This is the outcrop of the Balinan formation with nodular limestones, very similar to the limestones that we saw at Kuzatorig. And this is the enlargement of these nodular, they're very, they're like masses, uh, very uh, ill-defined layers of, uh, of uh, limestone, uh, which are partially dolomitized. And this remote locality was first described and recorded by the geological survey officers, uh, Jukes and Denoyer in 1863 in their memoir. What they were doing up there in the 1850s, now they got there, and how they found this locality, and they recorded nine species of trilobites from these limestones. These guys were really pioneers. And then in the 80s, Professor Holland in Trinity College 
at a, at, a, at a postdoc student working for him or working with him. And he was a black country paleontologist. Someone I think you may have heard of, Derek Sibiter. I think he's from Wolverhampton. Anyway, Derek studied in great detail the trilobites from the Ballinan Formation from that locality on the mountainside. And in his paper, which he published in Paleontology Journal in 1989, he said that this was the richest and best preserved trilobite fauna to have ever been discovered from Ireland. Very rich, 11 genera, 16 species of disarticulated but beautifully preserved trilobite keflons, free cheeks, and pygidia. So there were no complete specimens or fragmented but beautifully preserved. And what I think you'll notice about these trilobites is, is that they are, most of them are very spiny. These, these, these spiny trilobites belong to a group called the odontoplurids, and these are the dominant forms. Uh, now, I'm not sure what the habitat of these were, whether they were, were, were swimming trilobites as opposed to crawling trilobites, uh, but they were certainly in slightly deeper water, uh, possibly, than the usual assemblage that you get. These are, pardon me, these are then the, the trilobites that Derek found. Now, I put his assemblage, I know this is a bit blurry, but what I wanted to show this was to show the different types of trilobites he found. And he had over 700 specimens, and the majority were odontoplura, as you can see here. And what Derek uh, concluded from the limestone lithology and the nature of the assemblages of trilobites, he, he, he had a sentence in his paper and he said, the faunal and lithological evidence combined suggests that the limestones on Cow Connery may represent an Irish age equivalent of the much Wenlock limestone formation. Now, if I'm if I remember correctly, the limestones at Dudley are the much one lot limestone, but we, we can discuss that later. But this assemblage is probably different in character to the Dudley limestone assemblages in that it has this dominance of the spiny odontoplurid uh, trilobites. So that was the that's Kyle Connery there. There's the commons. This is a map here looking north. And this is the this is the Silurian inlier, and that was the Commons locality. And the final locality that I'm going to talk about very briefly is this locality here, which is the which is in Derrymore Glen. So this is this path here comes up from the sea on the north coast of uh, the Dingle Peninsula, and you walk in up this valley. It's about a two-hour walk to get to the Silurian inlier. It's a beautiful valley. The Derrymore Glen is a spectacularly glaciated valley, as you can see here. So you have to start way down here near the sea, and then you wind your way up the valley. You can see the rocks here in the, in the distance. These are the upper Devonian sandstones. But as you come further up, you go deeper down into the structure, the anticlinal structure, and you see then the crags on the hillside are Silurian. These are the Silurian Derrymore Glen formation. But this you can see the U-shaped valley, you've got, you've got ribbon lakes, you've got truncated spurs, you've got misfit streams. It really is a, a, a beautiful valley. So looking then at the Silurian rocks, these are thinly bedded sandstones and siltstones with the brachiopods that suggest a Ludlow age. So they're, they're younger than the um, than the um, <coughs> rocks we saw in the Dingle Peninsula, uh, mapped by John Parkin in 1975, and they have these very tight, plunging, recumbent folds with the steep cleavage, as you can see here. And as you proceed further up the, the, the valley, to the head of the valley, to the amphitheatre at the top of the valley, you can see there is a distinct boundary in the back wall of the amphitheater. This is the Corrie Lake at the top. It's dammed here by, by, by moraine, uh, but this is the Corrie Lake 
And here is the contact. And we'll show you more detail of that. This is, uh, uh, the contact is this large fault, the Connery fault, which is the bounding fault of the inlier. And that runs all the way down to the south coast where it forms the bounding fault at the uh, inlier at Anaskor near the Bull's Head in Kuzatari. And on the right hand side, we have the Silurian Cahoconry formation, which is much more fine grained than the Derrymore Glen formation. And it has graptolites of Scanicus age, which is in the lower part, the Gorstian uh, uh, stage of the Ludlow. And here it is faulted against the middle Devonian inch conglomerate, the spectacular structure at the northern end, uh, sorry, the, uh, <coughs> the southern end of, of the Derrymore Glen. So as you can see, you have to work a lot harder uh, and walk a lot further to see the rocks of the Anaskor Derrymore Glen in Lyre. Now, I want to acknowledge at this point that, that I've been to Dingle on many, many years taking student field trips but much of the information that I've told you tonight has been, has been researched by other geologists. So I just want to acknowledge the contribution uh, to all the geologists, the, 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 the contributions they've made to the understanding of the geology of the Dinga Peninsula, over 190 years of study. And finally, I would like to say that Dingle is a great place to study geology, whether it's undergraduates, whether it's open university tutors, whether it's student field trips, or sorry, adult education field trips or society trips. And at this point, I'd like to extend an invitation to the Black Country Geological Society. If you ever want to visit the Dingle Peninsula on a field trip, I would be more than glad to lead you uh, and show you the rocks of the Dingle Peninsula. And of course, I'd have to finish with a small prayer Let's pray that COVID restrictions end soon so we can all go back in the field. Yeah. So that's my end of the lecture. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, I can see why you've been so fascinated by this place. It's, it's got such a complex geological history and uh, you've taken us through it. And I think the next thing is to come and see it. Um, we, we, we did, we've talked about it briefly, um, but, uh, and we just hope that we can do it someday.